Hello, everybody. Welcome to Lauren.Live. I've got Tom Cronin with me from Australia. How are you, Tom? I'm great. Thanks for inviting me along today. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. You guys, we have a lot to talk about today. Tom has a lot going on. He is an author, a speaker, a meditation teacher. He's the founder of well, uh, Stillness Project. And then uh, he is a producer of The Portal. It's a documentary. And we'll be talking about the specifics of that stuff in a few minutes. But uh, it's perfect timing to have you on the show because, man, there's a lot going on in the world. <laughs> there's a lot going on in Australia, too. Um, at least it's been making you know the news here with just some of the lockdown stuff, and so we can dive into that. But you know, as usual, I'd love to just first hear a little bit about just you and how did you find yourself in this space. The portal talks about consciousness and some other things. How did you get to where you are now, and and what kind of stuff happened in your life to pique your interest about this topic and meditation and all of that that kind of stuff? Yeah, look, I kind of see my life as a little bit of a, a sort of microcosm of what's happening on the planet in the macrocosm. And that's really what inspired me to start the Stillness Project and the film The Portal in that I was very ignorant of my path. I was ignorant of what was a deeper uh, understanding of spiritual awareness and what was the subtler aspect of my reality. I was very much trapped in my ego. So I was a broker on a trading room floor making lots of money and got swept along by the culture, the mindset, the particular, you know, environment of what it was to be on a finance in the finance industry on a trading room floor in the late eighties, early nineties. And so it was just, you know, turn up to work, makes lots of money, end up taking lots of drugs, drinking lots, Mm -hmm. and just being really swept along by that culture, which was fine when I was 19, 20, 21. But what happened was over time, my innate natural intelligence in my body was really quite remarkable as it is in our own individuals, bodies collectively and individually, there's an intelligence to let us know that what we're doing, if it's not appropriate, if it's not aligned with natural law, then we start to get these symptoms and it starts to show up as an intelligence trying to guide us and, 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 and get us to pivot or deviate from our current trajectory that we're on. And so I started getting anxiety and panic attacks and depression, insomnia, and of course, me being my sort of egoic, narcissistic, you know, just just do what I want to do to satisfy some desires and some unfulfilled sort of experiences, then I just kept doing the same thing. But what happens is the, the intelligence isn't stupid. It doesn't just go, oh, okay, you win. You just keep doing what you're doing and I'll just make life really good for you. It just turns up the dial. And so these symptoms that we get, they're like red lights on the dashboard. And my symptoms just got worse and worse and worse until I eventually had a full-blown nervous breakdown. And this is what we call in Sanskrit a rashi, and it's a crisis point that makes the current trajectory unsustainable and a pivot must happen here. That's breakdown or breakthrough. So for me, my breakdown was literally where I was contemplating whether I wanted to go on with life. Uh, I was really challenged with the idea that there just was no light at the end of the time. I couldn't find any fulfillment. I was really deeply depressed. Um, But interestingly, the universe, you know, through some divine intervention, uh, I was sitting at home watching TV and there was a guy, uh, they were doing a documentary about him and he was talking about how successful he was. And one tiny little slither of that story was that he used meditation and it was just phenomenal for me. That was like this sort of moment, a turning point in my life that said, that's something that I need to learn. And I had never come across meditation but it was actually the starting point for me to start diving into that space. And that was the beginning of my journey into meditation, mindfulness and spirituality. Wow. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. I've noticed a common theme with guests and other people I've been speaking to lately about breakdowns are the, you know, lead you to a breakthrough. And I really think that is what's going on as a collective right now in our world. Things are breaking down that aren't working but of course, there's chaos, there's dark nights, there's, you know, it's uncomfortable. So that's interesting. Um, before we go there, this is kind of a segue. Do you have an opinion or uh, any intuition on what's going to happen in the financial aspect of the world? Because you said you, you used to work in that sector. I know that's a bit of a tangent, but it kind of has a play in what's happening right now with changes. Um with power and in the world banking system and crypto. I know this is a bit of a rabbit hole, but it just caught my attention that you used to work in that sector. Do you have any opinions on that? I do. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't like to be alarmist um, because, you know, we sometimes we can, if we all put our attention on one thing, we can make it happen. Um, 
what I what I have a, a deep concern about is that um, we don't seem to learn lessons very quickly as a species. So this idea that if I keep acquiring things, then I will be more fulfilled. So that's the premise for our current commercial capitalistic economic financial system. Um, and it's all built on the need for everything to continue to grow. So every business has to have continued growth. Continued growth means continued sales. Continued sales means, means continued consumption. Continued consumption means chronic expenditure. So what we have now is a debt bubble that we have never seen anything like it in the history of humankind. It, GFC is like minuscule compared to what we have now as far as the global debt that we've suddenly created in literally just 10 years. And the, that, that debt is, um, it's a false economy. So we've seen asset bubble on every level. That's gold, cryptos, uh, um, housing, everything really is just an incredible bubble. Share markets are all on record highs. And yet we've been through a GFC, we've been through a, a pandemic, and yet we have this incredible bubble of assets at huge levels of disproportionate uh, price, prices. And that's purely because there's a false economy, which is just fake money being pumped continuously into the system. At some point, we have to be accountable for that. At some point, there has to be a lesson that consumption at any cost regardless, um, has to come with a price and it will come in many different shapes and forms. It could be a complete, uh, collapse in the U S dollar, which is probably a highly likely outcome because of the incapacity, in, un, incapable ability for the U S government to be able to pay that debt. This is not going to be possible. They've already had, already had to raise the debt ceiling a couple of times and only just got the last one through. Um, yeah, I just think that there's going to be some ramification. We can't live in this dreamlike utopia of just continually borrowing and consuming and seeing assets going up without a price. So I'm not sure what that will look like, but there's going to be some ramification at some point in the future, which usually happens to shake out the system. And I don't think it's going to be that far away, my, my, my feeling. Yeah, I think so too. I just figured that's one. I haven't specifically spoke about that topic on the show, but it's part of this, whatever you want to call it, awakening the shift that's one part of it, right? I mean, we have our health, we have issues with health. Um, obviously, we can see that underlying issues with COVID, that's a huge thing. We have stuff going on with uh, civil rights and prejudice issues coming out, financial system. So each part is showing the flaw. And uh, like you said, there's gonna be some learning lessons in that. So that was kind of an interesting... Yeah. My, my concern also, because I've been going down the rabbit hole of cryptos and, and I really love the idea of cryptos and decentralization and the fact of it's something that can continually evolve and emerge. And this is something that we see in what we call a game B world, which we're morphing and moving towards. We're not quite there yet, but we're certainly on the cusp of a game B paradigm out of a game A paradigm, which we can go into at some point if you wish to. But the, the, the game B principle is that things continually emerge and evolve because of the, the nature of intelligence and cosmos, which is evolution. However, um, what concerned me about cryptos is, as I went further and further into it, is that they're falling into the same trap again, which is the huge levels of, um, of borrowing. Um, which creates a false economy. And, and this is, I like the initial, initial principles of cryptos, but when I started to see how extremely leveraged that crypto industry is now, that started to have me concerned as well because a lot of the inflated prices of cryptos is because of the ability to borrow that money, which you don't have, borrow the crypto, I should say, which you don't have. And it's kind of like leverage into it at a huge level. You know, they're paying like 16% on some of these platforms, Nexo, uh, DeFi and that. I'm not sure all of them, but it's, it's like, how can you possibly pay 16% interest on this? And it's just because it's so highly leveraged, which it, it, it leads to the potential for that bubble to burst as well. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I don't know a ton about it. My husband's in, into it and tries to explain it to me, but in some ways it's refreshing because it's like, okay, it's another source, right? It's not with this Absolutely. corrupt world bank that's so messed up on so many levels. It's away from the government control. But I wonder too if governments, obviously they have to be thinking about how can they get into that sector, right? I mean, 
they'll probably oh, they will, yeah they're, they're already looking into that now so the yeah. governments are looking to uh, obviously reclaim their lost power exactly from that space and they're a bit slow behind the eight ball as most governments would be on, in that sort of space because the emerging world is going to emerge very very quickly and when you've got static systems which are government systems business systems health systems school systems they're very static and this is the the problem and one of the defining characteristics of a game a world is that things are very static so we haven't had a change or an evolution really in the education system in the marriage system in the political system i mean these are some of these you know um the health and education system all these are, are so uh well established and so deeply ingrained that their ability to pivot and evolve and adapt uh are very um, limited and that's what ultimately will be their demise and their downfall in that inability in an ever evolving world and an exponentially evolving world and their inability to adapt and evolve with that which will mean that it will immediately at some point be sorry not immediately it will gradually be uh, and eventually be replaced by a more evolving and relevant and adaptable system so we'll see new governance systems when you see new education systems when you see see new banking systems but they will try to compete with the the pace of change but whether they can keep up or not will be interesting to see yeah, that will be and also kind of makes sense that we would move into more of a digital versus a physical it is actually amazing that we still have physical coins <laughs> and paper if you really think about the way that we're such you know ruled by tech which that's a whole nother episode about the dangers i believe of like ai and all this stuff that's completely opposite of where we should be going where we're looking within and all externally all the time but we i don't know if we want to get into that um Okay. I've got to say, I'm, I'm just fascinated that America is one of the most uh, advanced countries in some respects. You know, they come up with some of the most incredible technological development. Yet I still get a paper check sent across the world from my publishing company oh my in, in America. It's like, you guys still send <laughs> right? checks in the mail. Why don't you just digitally put it into my bank? So <laughs> it's just like so bizarre. Yeah, we have, we have the ability or like, you know, yeah, same thing like uh, work doing legal documents and having to send, you know, from the US to the UK, like hard copies of <laughs> NDA sign. I'm like, we could do this over, you know, hello sign or whatever digitally, but yeah, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, okay, well, thanks for touching on that. And then what about uh, quickly? Yeah, let's dive in to, um, I don't know, we don't have to quickly necessarily, but I, I know we have so much to talk about with just your projects in the portal, but um, I, I'm not familiar with, I have an idea about it, but the, you're saying game A and game B. Do you mind describing what that is? Yeah, so Daniel Schmachtenberger in our film uh, is one of the greatest minds on the planet, I believe. Uh, such an incredible progressive thinker, which is going to be uncomfortable for some people to listen to him. Um, but he's with a group of people that are starting to map out new language and, I guess, a guide or roadmap for this new world that we're morphing into, transitioning into. In Sanskrit, this understanding has been around for thousands of years, and it was an understanding that we're currently in what's called Kali Yuga, an age of ignorance, where we ignore essential aspects of our being, which is consciousness, which is spirituality, which is mysticism, which is, you know, awareness. Um, and, and all the things that come from that once that's revealed. So let's just say enlightenment has been around for thousands and thousands of years, but 99.99999% of the world's population has chosen to ignore that as a potential experience and much rather go shopping and go to the races and go to the pub or do whatever we do to get distracted, scroll through our screens. Um, but in a game B world, what we're seeing is this um, rapid exponential growth of people moving into that awareness and that experience of waking up. So that's why plant medicine, meditation, yoga, all these different tools and devices that give us access to that experience of what's inherently within us starts to awaken um, a whole new human that is now moving out of what we call Kali Yuga into Sat Yuga. Sat Yuga is a period of time where people are actually experiencing that essential nature, that fundamental quality, which is enlightenment mm. and a state of consciousness and wisdom that, that prevails from that state. So again, B, then what happens when we get uh, the masses collectively moving into that state, which is happening quite quickly, um, then everything that they create, do and experience is going to be from that state of consciousness. So they start creating systems that aren't for the individual um, gain and need. They're going to, generally by default going to be created systems for a wellness and uplift for the masses in the whole. And when we say the masses, we don't just mean the masses of humans, but we're talking about the plants and the animals, the planet itself mm -hmm. in equal portions and humans start to reposition themselves back into an equality 
with the planet, not inequality as well as other humans, but inequality with the planet and um, sort of get out of that hierarchical position of extraction mode. So Game B is a, you can go to Wikipedia and just type in Game B sure. or Game B Wiki and you'll find some uh, some defining characteristics of what that world will start to look like sure. as we morph into it. Is it kind of like, I mean, I've the term like a new earth in a way? Absolutely, yeah. yeah it's very much what, uh, you know, Eckhart Tolle yeah. was walk, talking about in his book. Yeah. Um, this has been on the horizon and so we're at this really exciting and challenging uh, pivot point because you can't get to game B whilst game B structures are in place. So the game B, game A structures have to start to collapse and crumble yeah. for, it's like a renovation. If you've got an old house and you want to build a new house, um, there has to be a point in time where that old house becomes so irrelevant um, that you actually deconstruct it yeah. and you can't reconstruct the new house until you deconstruct the old house. And so we're in this early stage of deconstruction. Simultaneously, we've got some people, interestingly, that are starting the reconstruction process. So I've got some friends that are already starting to design your economic models that um, built on commoditization of things. They're on the revaluing of what, what value is. It's a reassessment of what value is. So for instance, in the film and in the book, Daniel talks about we, we, we don't value a tree. We value the four by two in the tree. We don't value the oceans. We value the whales in the oceans. We don't value bees. We value the honey that bees produce. So we have to have a re-weighting of what, what is value, mm-hmm. a reassessment of what is value. And in these new economic models, I've had a glimpse into them as they tried to explain them to me. They're quite fascinating because things like uh, Amandine, who's in our film, she works in some of the most challenging environments in the, on the planet, you know, trying to bring solutions to impoverished and suppressed and oppressed people. So someone like Amandine in the new world, in a new economic model, will be incredibly wealthy mm. based upon these new economic models that recognize and reward people for their contribution or companies on their contribution rather than reward them on their ability to extract and commoditize something mm. So they're very different ways of seeing what a business model, an economic model will look like. Interesting. Yeah, I definitely see this stuff starting to happen now. I mean, I even have a friend that like moved off the grid. She's like growing her own, you know, garden. She's got goats now. She's never like this before. I knew, you know, knew her five years ago. So just like a example, tangible example of people. And she's got this whole group of people and they're starting to do bartering and trading. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, yeah. you think like this is stuff that people did a long time ago, but it's like almost a re, it's coming around again because what we're doing now isn't really working. It's not sustainable. It seems like it's working, but it really isn't if you have any clue what's going on in the world. So it's, that's fascinating to see people starting to really shift into a different, it is, it's a different paradigm. Um, okay. That's fascinating. So that, is that some of the type of topics that you speak about and, and show in the, in the portal? Your documentary? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we look at things on a micro and a macro level because the two can't be, it can't be separated. They're mm-hmm. actually interwoven. And this is why, um, you know, a lot of the people listening today may possibly start feeling like, oh, I just feel like buying less or I just feel like decluttering my house or I just feel like living simply. I just feel like going to live on land. So there's there's this collective shift which individuals will start feeling thinking it's their own shift, but it's actually part of a collective shift of recalibrating back into a, a natural process that we've become very disconnected from and that's causing immense levels of suffering if not possibly self-termination of an entire species so we do cover that but um you know it's it's a really it's not an accident that you know we've got marie kondo coming out with her book here and over here we've got uh you know some other person wanting to reduce plastics in the ocean and these are all interwoven and interconnected by a collective awakening to our our individual place and role on the planet and what it is that we're here for and what are we here to contribute or do. So it's, it's going to be a really interesting time because the people that thrive and flourish from the old paradigm won't want the new paradigm to start to, to emerge. And so you're going to see a lot of um, oppression, suppression from those powers that are currently at the head of that pyramid, that pinnacle, that a thriving and flourishing where we have 0.5, what, half a percent of the world's 
wealthy elite having all the control and all the wealth over the other 99.5. So they're not going to want to see those systems Mm. broken down because those systems work very well for them. So you'll see a lot of oppression and resistance in the, uh, in the, in the time ahead. Yeah, I agree. I think there's way more to come, Uh, but that is, that's the friction that's happening right now. People, this doesn't feel right. I think I want to make a change. No, no, no. You need to keep doing what we've been doing. And um, that is interesting that you speak about that because I, I've been feeling that too. And I've had conversations with friends, even just about Christmas coming up. Like I don't, I told my parents, I'm like, I don't, they're like, what do you want this year? I'm like, I don't want more stuff. Like I really, it's not fulfilling. I don't have the room for it. I really don't want stuff. It's been like this for the last few years. And I really think the pandemic actually helped me amongst other things that forces you to reevaluate. I was at home all the time. So naturally it wasn't going out like I used to as a city girl and networking and events and I used to go out with girlfriends for happier all the time and I was like always oh, social I didn't really I think I bought maybe one or two apparel items over the last year and now I have bought more things because things are kind of I'm going out more but it was a good reflection of like one I'm not going out I don't need more crap just accumulating and two like I don't need this stuff so small awakenings like that happening. And I know I've talked to many other people, the pandemic, it forced us to really reevaluate our lives. So I think if stuff starts happening with the financial system, you're going to completely look at what am I doing with my money? Am I saving it? Do I need to, I'm buying only the necessities and it forces us to actually go more simple, right? Shelter, health, obviously in the last year with COVID, year and a half, two years, uh, family, basic needs and uh value what are your values it's really forcing us to look at this stuff so all this uncomfortable stuff that's happening people like i don't get it lauren you keep talking about this like great awakening else i'm like look deeper it's forcing us to look at the stuff that's not working and it's really in some ways it's simplifying our lives and others for others maybe more difficult it depends where you are in the journey but there's so much beauty and potential from all the stuff going on right now if you're conscious to it right it, it's it's so simple and so powerful and can happen literally within months if everyone on the planet suddenly said okay gosh i work really hard for my money I, i'm going to live within my means i'm going to spend only what i have because this is what we used to do right even my grandparents and my, even my parents probably only spent what they had this idea of credit cards the idea of borrowing the idea of debt it's only a very new phenomenon and it was very deeply programmed into us because it really served a very small portion of people on the planet for us to all be yeah. enslaved in debt. But if we got back to living very simply, um, growing a lot of our own food, which we can, uh, even in small houses and small parcels of land, we can grow a lot of food there. Yeah. Um, it blows me away how few fruit trees there are. Uh, in public parks, in in people's back gardens, in people's front gardens, like it's like we've got so much capacity to grow food and support ourselves. Um, but the the idea, if we suddenly stopped borrowing money, firstly and secondly, um, we realised that fulfilment isn't something to commoditize or extract from some other acquisition or experience, but it was something that we sustain through our own spiritual awakening. And then thirdly we realize that through that awakening that this vessel that I have that I'm carrying around this body, um, it's such a powerful device to have such an incredible immune capacity to so many things that um, when I realize what my sovereign capacity is for health and happiness, that means that I'm responsible for my health and my happiness in part, you know, you can get a broken leg because a car crash or soccer game or something like that. But as far as general overall health, where we, we take a deep responsibility for that as a species, it could possibly uh, cripple a lot of the systems because we would just be we would be sovereign from the need to be in those systems. And if everyone on the planet did that tomorrow, which we all can do, then it would completely change the nature of the planet in a really, really good way. Yeah. But a lot of people would be really uh, unhappy with that process because the, the current economic model is built on the idea of us being unhappy and unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, which it, it seems to have been working for quite some time. Isn't that so sad? When you, when you really realize that and you think about it, I think a lot of people are just so, they've got the blinders on, right? If you, when you really break things down and you realize like the pharmaceutical companies and the hospitals are profiting on us being sick, that's so sad. And not, there are great, wonderful nurses and doctors that are helping people and some people, like you said, there are accidents, but generally speaking, this chronic illness, this rise in chronic illness, 
we should be focusing so much more on that. Our food system, like you said, growing our own things, improving soil, removing the chemicals, Roundup. It's a big one that I'm very passionate about uh, that I believe is responsible for a lot of our sickness and cancers. Simple things up high. It's not easy and quick to fix when you're down here, but it'd be a quick fix to just make that illegal. But money and convenience and all that stuff, the it's just... I don't know, blows my mind. It seems easy to fix, but it's not because it's been so ingrained for so long and we've well, given too uh, much power. The, to the, the only thing that can change it, um, this is the, the the premise that I come from. And first, I just want to state that we, we don't want to discredit the amazing work that the medical system is doing. Oh, it's it's no, doing phenomenal yes, things yes. To, to give us longer lifespans yes. and fix problems. And so it, it's Absolutely. with deep respect for what's going on there. What, what I'm passionate about is... Um, is preventative health uh, and that's you know to, to really respect and understand that health isn't a given it's something we have to work with have to work for you know for me i'm 54 i go to the gym three to four times a week i go to sauna three times a week i do yoga three times a week i um you know i eat well i grow my own uh, vegetables to have green smoothies and um you know i i make sure that i still could do better than what i'm doing but you know i'm still have fun and enjoy the delights of yummy food, but uh, it's about having a deep respect for what needs to happen and what needs to take place for me to be healthy. But coming back to the change of the system, we can't, it doesn't work by forcing things. It has to be something that happens when people open up their minds and they start seeing through, there's a, there's a sort of sequence that happens. Firstly, there's some degree of inquiry from the individual to look within. And you mentioned that before, look within and start inquiring. And that can be through meditation, can be through yoga, through breath work, through plant medicine, whatever your tool is. For me, the one that I teach and one that was relevant to me was meditation and that level of internal inquiry to transcend the code of my mind, the code of my ego, the code of my conditioning, and to access an innate wisdom and innate knowingness. And from there, what happens is that there's a veil that gets pulled back across from the veneer of your, your, your gaze. You know, there, there's a, there's a, 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 a a veil of that you've been filtering life through your personality, your conditioning, your coding, your culture. And when that comes back across the, the, the gaze and you start to see the world in a fundamental way rather than a conditioned way, it's very hard to put that veil back across again and start to go back to seeing things the way you're used to. And so from there, you start to question things. So first you start to see, then you start to question, but why are we doing that? Why am I doing that? Why am I behaving that way? Why do I think that way? Why do I respond and react to life that way? We start to question, then we start to challenge. Well, that doesn't make sense. I don't want to do that anymore. We shouldn't be doing that anymore. We should change this status quo. We start to question, challenge, and then we start to be proactive about creating change. How do I create change in this world where, you know, these current systems or status quos aren't really any more appropriate? So that sort of stage by stage process is what needs to take place. And the first step in that is that people need to start waking up. They need to start meditating because we see when they use these tools, whether it's plant medicine, yoga, qigong, breath work, they, they by default start to change the way they want to live in the world. And I think that's got to be the starting point. You can't just enforce systems upon people without changing the state of mind of the people in the system. Sure. Yeah. Nicely said. Um, I agree with you. Yes. Um, how, how do people start getting into that? I mean, if it's foreign to people, right. Meditating or, you know, like that's a big shift or becoming more conscious. People, maybe they just don't know where to start. What is some advice? Well, here, this is why this is why we're in crisis because everything is a force of evolution, and evolution can work very smoothly and calmly, or evolution can work very rupturously. Mm-hmm. And in Sanskrit, this is what we call a rashi. A rashi is a crisis point that is a process to dislodge a stuck something that's stuck in the process that should be fluid. So it's like if a river is banking up because there's something blocking it eventually that force has to be so great to remove that blockage that allows this gushing through of the river to continue that flow. And so we're moving towards this sort of bottleneck of stuckness in that we're not adapting, we're not evolving and are not growing. So for me, that's what happened to me. Um, I was stuck. I was rigid. I was static. I was unevolving. I was holding on to old status quo, old patterns that became irrelevant 
And so the universe gives us a number of, or let's just change the universe for a natural intelligence, gives us a number of cues along the way to adapt and change, adapt and change, adapt and change, adapt and change. And that's how we evolve. It's how we grow. And it's how we have a fluid, calm, um, peaceful existence. But if we're getting turbulence, it's the universe's way of saying, aha, okay, I'm going to give you a few cues here to start to question what you're doing. And if we ignore those cues, that the volume just gets turned up. So if we, we can, by intuitively just sensing without some turbulent experience to start to explore meditation or to start to explore plant medicine, you might just feel an inkling arising within you to start to awaken some deeper sense of awareness about yourself. But if that doesn't arise within you, or for some reason you're ignoring that in a cue, that in a guidance, then you'll get the message anyway, as a, as a species, as an individual, you're going to get the message anyway. Uh, it's just a matter of whether you get through that breakthrough or breakdown process, that rashi. And um, that's the, that's the unknown, whether we're going to manage collectively as a species to break through to gain B or whether we're going to self terminate. We're not sure which way it's going to go. Those are the people that are doing a lot of research into the ongoing sustainability of us as a species. Um, it's, it's a real nail biter at the moment. We're kind of like 22 all with three minutes to go and no one knows who's going to win this one. We might have to go into overtime. We need some extra time. <laughs> we might need some overtime. Yeah, absolutely. Ooh, yeah. Maybe some new refs. We, we got to reorganize this thing. Okay. I mean, I generally try to be, I'm throwing in like a joke. Like I get, yeah, we don't really know what's going to happen, but I mean, I feel like so many more people, that's what my whole podcast is about is like awakening. I feel like so many more people are awakening, beginning to channel that never channeled before getting stuff from the ethers. I mean, I get really woo woo on the show, but we can take, I like the approach that we're speaking about because it is this more practical, practical, tangible way of looking at it. Um, I feel like a lot of people are becoming more awake. Oh, it's happening so quickly. It's phenomenal. So it feels 100 million like people a good are on Calm app, you know. So yeah, it's yeah, happening so quickly. It feels quickly. like a good sign. I mean, we t we have a lot more to go through, a lot of work to do, and it could take lifetimes if you believe in that. But I do feel, like you said, even just the rise in like yoga, meditation, chakra healing, Reiki, energy healing. I mean, that kind of stuff. When I was a kid, like I didn't really hear about that. Granted, I was a kid, but still, I mean, it wasn't as popular in the last 10, 15 years, and even the last five years. There's so much of that. Um, more common and more accessible and less woo woo and weird. I mean, anybody can do that, whether you're Christian, atheist, me, like spiritual, whatever. So I feel like it's a good sign, but there is a lot of work to do. Um, we just don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but I think we're. Look, I mean, the, the yeah. digital revolution, I mean, the fact that the fact that we can do uh, podcasts and Zoom calls mm -hmm. and YouTube channels and social media is actually part of the process. Mm -hmm. Technological revolution is part of the spiritual revolution. The two mm -hmm. go hand in hand because you can't take ancient mysticism that was preserved in ancient monasteries and ashrams and caves for 10,000 years and really literally just a handful of the world's population having access to that knowledge and those techniques and those practices and for, for an entire planet to awaken into a spiritual revolution, there must be a form, a platform for the dissemination of that information to allow people to wake up. And so there's this beautiful synchronicity between the spiritual revolution and evolution and the digital revolution and evolution happening simultaneously. They're actually intertwined. They're not separated. They're actually part of the process. So of course there's some polarity in, in social media and things like that, but it actually can't happen without those platforms. That's a good point. I agree. Yeah. I mean, look at my whole thing is on That's right. talking it's to you in Australia. We would have probably <laughs> never connected. I mean, it's, it's simply amazing. And you know, hopefully thousands of people will listen to this video. It's amazing. They'll learn something. It'll touch them. And, um, yeah, there's some censorship issues and big data and some problems, but also I, I just continue to just think, you know what, I'm grateful for this tool. I'm going to use this to get messages and positivity out there. Um, they can't censor everybody. They can't silence us forever. Um, they meaning like we've the elite, some of the more dangerous people in the world that are controlling our media and our social media and the economy and whatever, but it's an amazing tool or like you creating a, a film, 
and sharing it on different platforms. It's touching people. It's making it accessible. I mean, a lot of my spiritual awakening is because of different Instagram accounts. I've connected with different mediums that I've had on the show that have Instagram. That's how I found them and got them on my show. It's simply incredible, the connectedness. But we need to also stay balanced um, because there are some negative bad things out there. And uh, again, like I kind of touched on with AI, I do know I've heard that can be quite a threat to us um, if you're not careful. So I think we need to be very like balanced in how we use this technology. It's very positive, but it can also be just yet another blinder, right? Just to kind of not look up from the screen. So it'll be an interesting, you know, next couple of decades to see with the advancements, but also you don't want to get trapped into it too deeply and not remembering to reconnect with yourself, nature, other people. So yeah. You know, Look, I mean, AI will be the greatest risk to humanity from, from all the reports that I've had from people in this, in that space, looking at yeah. existential risk to humanity. Uh, AI is, is, you know, we've got obviously nuclear weather environment, um, human displacement, uh, yeah. food shortages, but AI is probably the, the greatest one that we face. And that comes down to the challenge of us uh, having exponential technological development with, um, probably a lagging set of consciousness that's creating that technological development. Um, if the consciousness of the de designers of the technological development was, uh, you know, in check with the development of the technology, then would probably be okay. But there's probably faster development of technology with uh, not as fast yeah. a level of consciousness uh, keeping up with that. So unfortunately with that, what we'll have is technological development created by people that aren't conscious enough to consider the wellness of the whole. Yep. Uh, they'll be creating technology for the benefit of their own pursuits, which yeah. doesn't usually end well. That terrifies me to think about like robots and them controlling things or using that in like war, not to get negative, but I don't feel good about that. So I guess just another reminder to like look within and listen to your intuition further to your point before, you know, before like listening to yourself. I think we're not trained in, in culture to listen to your gut enough stuff comes through for a reason. So pay attention. If something doesn't feel good, it's not serving you any longer, your old lifestyle, my thing with, I used to buy a lot more. It's not serving me any well. Certain foods I'm like appalled by, junk food, different things. I have no, you know, desire to eat those or support companies that put stuff in their food. Listen to yourself. That's yourself trying to take care of yourself and evolve. So intuition will be very important with technology. And um, if you're feeling like you're on it too much, listen to yourself. Get outside. It's as simple as that. That's just being conscious, right? So yeah, we have something very powerful inside. We just have to be aware of it. Yeah, I think that's the, the biggest shift that's going to take place on the planet. Uh, you know, we're looking at all the wonderful, exciting things that are happening outside of us, but the biggest shift that's taking place right now and, and the one that will continue to hopefully, uh, you know, expand and grow on is is the that inner connection. In Sanskrit, it's called um, Turiya, the fourth state. So connecting to that inner state of beingness and that you can use a number of different words to describe that, that spirituality, that intuition, that source, God, um, higher self, that is really a guiding force within us, um, getting out of our emotional body and out of our mental body or transcending our emotional body and our mental body. You know, there's so much emphasis on emotions these days, but they're, um, you know, reacting on emotions, living through emotions is not a very conducive way to, to operate, to function. It's very much reactive mode. And, uh, you know, we see children have very ex extreme emotions, emotional reactions. They don't get their ice cream. They don't get their toys. They have this huge tantrum. Um, and so we want to evolve beyond that uh, yeah. and start operating from a very spiritual state of awareness. And some might say that's spiritual bypassing, but it's actually, to some respects, I call that growing up uh, and to um, evolve into a new way of operating. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we can't laugh and cry and I still have emotions. So sure. we've just got to be... Um, a little bit more sovereign in our states and less reactive and response, uh, responsive. Sure. And, and maybe realizing like we are not our feelings. Uh, they don't define us. Like if that makes sense, like of course you're allowed to feel sad and move through that. I think that's actually very important, but, uh, and not trap it. Cause that can be something trauma, you know, mm. fear and stuff. It's just, that can cause health problems or other issues, but, um, you are not necessarily your thoughts and that gets into like meditation and just being like, I am, I am in a s different state. So that's hard though, because we are emotional beings here in like this 3d plane. Right. But 
being able to separate yourself from a feeling can be very beautiful too. So it's about balance. It's that ability to watch. It's the ability yes. to observe. Yes. And we to, to be able to observe, we call it Sakshi Kutashta, which is the silent witness. So there's a, there's this silent witness that observes our thoughts, our feelings, our physical actions, our physical body. And from that independent sovereign observer, then we start to have more empowerment, more capacity, more adaptability. And that's the thing that's missing here is that ability. It's in our trailer. You know, Julia Mosbridge says, you know, most people don't realize that inner space exists. Mm. And so that's the thing that we want to um, support and assist humanity in realizing it's within them. It's, it's, it's innate and that what we have currently is distraction disease where we're so obsessed and caught up in the external world because the degrees of pleasure and pain that it brings us that we, to some degree, have ignored what's inherently deep within us. And that's a big shift that we need to start doing is moving our attention inward. Yeah, I agree. It's almost an analogy I had, like, just now, like being in a kind of an unhealthy relationship, you know, maybe we've all, I know I've been on one before, it's so much passion, but then it's also so like toxic and, and up and down and, but it's like these highs and lows and you almost get addicted to it and becomes your normal. It's almost like sometimes that's what life is like. You know, I'm getting all this attention on social media. I'm high and then I'm feeling really sad today because he didn't text me or like, I mean, that's just, those are stupid examples, but like these highs and lows that really don't matter. And it could be with anything in life, your job success, whatever. Um, Yeah, it's so distracting and it's not healthy and it's not sustainable. And I don't know, like we are. Well, our society has been so programmed to be that way. Yeah. You know, every Netflix show, every Amazon show, you know, all TV drama, it's, it's a deep coding and conditioning that that's, you know, every music song has got drama in it. And right. we're, we're so coded to live a dramatic life. Yeah. You know, we don't want to watch anything that doesn't have drama in it, mm-hmm. highs and lows. And um, interestingly, enlightenment is actually quite stable. If not, I wouldn't say boring because it's blissful but it's certainly undramatic. It doesn't have these extreme peaks and troughs. And so for for large part, a lot of us don't want to have that experience yet. We don't want to have stable bliss. Mm. Um, You know, we don't want to have stable lovingness. We want to have loss. We want to have love. We want to have excitement. We want to have pain. We want to have fear. We want to have anger. And so we, we create circumstances to validate and um, to, to create um, an experience that we believe is a way of living. It's funny. I did a conference not long ago as a business conference on how to be a better business operator. But a part of that was also personal development. And they were saying there's two aspects of life that should have very little, if not no drama in them. And that's your relationship in your business. He says, what we tend to do is put a lot of drama in our relationships, a lot of drama in our business. He says, it should be very stable, very consistent. Uh, you know, some of the most consistent and boring and stable business models is Google taking $6 a month from their Google drive subscriptions, $6 a month, $6 a month, $6 <laughs> yeah. a month, $6 a month, hundred million people, 1 billion people, 1 billion people, $6 a month. It's like, just, just keep it ticking over, yeah. right? Don't need to change the model. Just keep sure. it boring. And so a, a very sustainable relationship is one that has less drama in it. I think. Hey, I, I finally, after many, many relationships, <laughs> I married the stable one. The safe, the safe and the nice one. It wasn't like this all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's better in the Beautiful. long run. Trust me. Um, cool. Wow. Um, okay. Well, before we, I don't want to run out of time. I want to um, make sure we talk about a little bit more about your film and then also the stillness project. Um, before we get to the stillness project. So, and forgive me, you kind of mentioned how you got into it, but uh, when did you make the film? Well, the starting point of the film came around 2012, okay. uh, even probably a, the very early stages of it, 2011, which is this idea that um, I became very, very passionate about bringing meditation out to the world. Mm-hmm. I had a business partner that was also very passionate about creating something digital online. We just finished Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week. He was in a job that he didn't like. I was in a job I didn't like. How can we have a job that, you know, we don't have to work so hard. And so we decided that, you know, we'd create some digital programs and maybe a movie around getting meditation out to the world. And it was hot off the press of um, The Secret that mm-hmm. managed to bring a very esoteric subject matter to the world, you know, the law of attraction and penetrate the households of the world with a film and a book. So I was very inspired by that idea that I could bring an esoteric subject. You know, at the time, meditation was not a well-known idea. 
uh, there was before apps and everything. And so um, decided to make a film and a book that would, was not just an information piece. We didn't want to just provide information. You should meditate because X, Y, Z. We wanted to provide a film that was a journey. It was, you know, talking about drama. It had drama in it, you know, because we wanted to make it entertaining. And so we were looking for six stories that all had crisis and all had transformation. We wanted to contrast meditation's capacity against a crisis and against a, a, a blueprint that was an unsustainable blueprint. So we looked at different personalities and different stories that um, had crisis in their story and had meditation as the tool for them to get out of that. So we, we managed to create this beautiful film of these six stories that we follow through their crisis and their, and their transformation using meditation. Mm. So that was the sort of premise of the film and the book. And then we had three futurists that sort of give us a macro perspective, which is Daniel Schmachtenberger, Mikey Siegel and Julia Mosbridge that look at humanity from a larger perspective, where we were, where we are and where we're going to mm. uh, as a, as a whole. Wow. So you just had this idea, like it just came to you. Do you feel like it was channeled in or do you feel like it's your calling? Or I mean, like, it's an amazing um, story. Like, Yeah, look, it's to be honest with you, it, it was an impulse that ar- uh, arose from within me and a passion. Um, okay. I, I will have to be really transparent. It's probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. And still to this day, I'm struggling with the, the impact of choosing to go down that path. It's been financially challenging, um, physically, energetically quite demanding. Um, it hasn't, you know, it's one of those things that, uh, you don't know what you don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Let's just pay some money for investors and go make a film. Um, it's just, it was, I, I'm very kind of naturally an optimistic person without just, you know, really weighing up all the pros and cons. So it, it hasn't been a, a walk in the park in all honesty. It's been a, it's something that's, I've grown a lot through that process. It's been very challenging. It's, it's taught me a lot. Um, still to this day it has its challenges, but, um, we'll see where it takes us uh, in the future. Yeah, well, good for you for challenging yourself and putting something out to the world. I mean, that's what I'm yeah. doing too with this podcast. You know, we'll see. Like you just, you have to put the hard work in and, and ask the universe mm. and your meditations or whatever to support you. And I believe, you know, if you genuinely have goodness in your heart and you are doing something for the better, that you will be supported. So I, I wish you luck with the you know, Thank you. that continued challenge. And I hope that <laughs> many people will watch it and support you. Um, and then the Stillness Project can you explain what that is about and how you feel? Yeah, I guess that? that's, the, that's the premise behind everything that I, I believe about change. Change is very difficult to embrace when we're operating from a very static mindset that's very deeply coded. We have these, in Sanskrit, it's called vasanas, these tendencies of the mind where there's neurological patterns that we just keep living over and over again the same, you know, cycles of, you know, conditioning. Um what I find when we start meditating is that we break, we tr- firstly transcend the code. We start to operate from a very different place. And I could see that within my own life, nothing really changed until I started meditating. Um, and then I started seeing it in a lot of my students and other colleagues and friends that started meditating, that their lives started to progressively change for the better when they started meditating. That's simply because not so much that meditation was doing it. It's just that it was enabling the the ability to access a field of intelligence that was not in the mind, the mind, we were in the mind, the field of mind. And so all potential or creativity is around us. We're in it rather than it's in us. And so the stillness project was about trying to bring and mainstream this particular style of transcending meditation to the world in a way that allowed, um, you know, meditation to become more accessible and more widely used. So hopefully from that place, hopefully bring about change on the planet. Wow. I really love that. Um, as we kind of come to a close, are there any tips you have for people that are trying to meditate? I mean, I always would love to meditate more. It's a goal of mine, but just people that aren't familiar with it, maybe they haven't done it or they used to it and they want to get back into it. Do you have a few tips just to kind of encourage people? And some people don't even know like how to do it really. They, you know, there's no rules, but I mean, just how, where, where can one start, I guess? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a bit of a minefield because there's so many different types of meditation, particularly now with apps with, you know, thousands of different sure. styles on them. Um, I would suggest do research into different styles that you're going to find that will resonate the most with you. For me, I found those deeper transcending styles of meditation with mantras like Vedic meditation or transcendental meditation for me, much more effective, much more accessible and much more impacting. I really saw tangible results very quickly. 
And secondly, they were very blissful. Because of the nature of that blissfulness of the experience, rather than it being a frustrating experience, some meditations are just done right frustrating. Uh, and if it's frustrating, if it's challenging, if it's not enjoyable, yeah. there's very little likelihood that we're going to be drawn to doing that on a daily basis because we've set up very charming lives where we have a lot of charming um, distractions like ice cream and Netflix and scrolling through our phones. So these distractions are very pleasurable and we naturally do things that are pleasurable. So if the meditation itself isn't pleasurable, it's going to be hard for it to be, you know, supersede those other charming propositions that can pull our attention in on a daily basis. So for me, finding one that you can integrate on a day, daily basis, uh, ideally twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, my recommendation usually is to learn from a qualified teacher just because you're going to get the depth of knowledge that comes with that program rather than just trying to wing it yourself, close your eyes and empty your mind. You're just going to find there's so many things why that's not going to work for you. Um, when we meditate, particularly if we go deep, uh, there's a lot of stress releasing that can unfold and having some guidance and support around that. If we want to be calm and blissful and light and joyful, then a lot of the deep layers of trauma and stress that are trapped in the physiology and this is the thing people don't realize is how much our uh, our state is a physiological state a lot of people are treating things on a therapy mental intellectual level or on a spiritual level but we do hold deep traumas and deep samskaras or, or scars in the body that need some um, particular exercises and processes to go through for that clearing to happen. And it's not pretty when it does. So you're definitely having some support yep. through that process is going to be important. So that's one thing that we always offer with our meditation teaching is ongoing support for the student. For me, it's a weekly Zoom call that anyone that learns from me either in my online program or in my weekend workshop, uh, they get ongoing access to those weekly sessions where we meditate together and they can ask questions and I can support them with any transformational cha changes or challenges they're going through. Mm. Nicely said. Yeah, I agree. It's nice to have some support. Cause I've been doing it off and on too, but even it's a lifelong practice. I mean, like you said, I just find myself so distracted on my phone and I'm like, no, but like I want to do it, but then I like fall asleep <laughs> and I don't do it. And so I've made a goal now every morning when I wake up to do my gratitude prayers and meditation and speak to some spirit guys and do different things I'm playing around with and my intuition center and all that chakra clearing. But I try to do it first thing before I even look at my phone because otherwise I know I probably won't get to it. Because there's just so, so many distractions. There's yeah. so many. Even when you know and you've done meditation and you love it and you want to do it more, it's still so hard. So really, yeah, <laughs> setting time aside where you know you'll get it done. And I think a lot of people will tell you the morning is the best time before you get going in your day because then it's harder yeah. to stop. But um, I do love the idea of having someone like yourself or a medium or someone trusted, and, you know, trained to help you because, like you said, there are a ton of different types of meditation and sometimes it can actually get intense. Things can come through. Or sometimes you'll just sit there and you feel like there's nothing, which actually there's beauty in that itself. But uh, I don't know what to do. So I don't know. It's just helpful, like you said. But some of those little apps are actually really great. Just even like a two-minute, three-minute meditation on your lunch break just to recenter, even if it's just breath work. Um yeah. yeah, they're all, they're all going to add value. You know, there's sure. so many amazing programs and apps out there. Even if you mm -hmm. just want to start with some free videos on YouTube, you know, there's mm -hmm. so much out there. So um, you don't have to go far to be able to find something that's going to help you to recenter, recalibrate, um, you know, um, and just start to find a little bit more of the excitation and karma sort of state. And the reason they call it a practice is because it takes practice. And I do think from at least my experience, the more that you do it, sometimes it just starts coming naturally. And, you know, like I'll be closing, I just close my eyes and then I'll start seeing chakra colors with no intention set. So once you open up yourself energetically or intuitively, and you start noticing and becoming more conscious, you'll notice these patterns that come through in life. And that's what's so cool. You know, as a human, sometimes you need that like tangible proof, like there's more out there, right? But yeah. I don't know, once you become conscious, like a lot of things start, dots connecting and change. And it's really, it's beautiful spiritual practice and journey. So. Yeah, it's one of the things that I, I try to inspire my students to do is to be open to the idea of 
being calm and less stimulated because most of the things that we do is to excite ourselves, to stimulate ourselves and to start to explore what it is to be still and silent uh, and to find a blissfulness. You'll find a, a deep, quiet, blissful lovingness in that space. Um, bliss and love aren't things that we extract from daily experience. We think someone gives us love, but they just have the capacity to trigger a sensational experience inside of us. But when we start to be open to the idea of an innate exploration to bliss and love, then we find that in stillness and silence and it just arises up from within us in that quietness that when we're conscious and awake. So that's something I'm just trying to get my students to sort of tweak their perspective about what they're seeking in life um, rather than excitation, look for the excitation, look for calm, look for tranquility, look for um, the, the silence and stillness. And in that you'll find something truly remarkable and invincibility to some respects. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, it's a process. And you'll also notice, I think, when you start doing that, like we've talked about before, not to be repetitive, but things start shedding also in your life and things that aren't serving you start to you know change or exit your life and make more room for that bliss or that calmness in being in the moment, which is so important. That in itself can just be a meditation. I think people think also you don't always have to sit there you know, cross leg with your hands like this and close your eyes. There's many forms of meditation. It's pausing, being one with your breath, you know, looking outside and, and being in the moment for a second. There's many ways to do that, but slowing down, <laughs> slowing down. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I just wanted to say that because I know we're all going through so much right now and we need to just be kind with ourselves. And it's hard. Some of the stuff people realize, like, oh, this isn't serving me anymore. And there's so much friction that's going on collectively right now because of that. So being calm, being kind to yourself and others, we're going through so much and what a perfect time to start meditating. It's something to really give us some strength and calmness through the chaos, right? I mean, it's never been a better time to to bring that into your life, in my opinion. So Yeah, absolutely. Now's yeah, the time. Yeah, now is the time. Now is all we have. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, is there anything else on your mind um, that you wanted to throw um, in? I guess just to share with the audience, you know, I always like to conclude with a, a nice simple message for people because we talked a lot of global stuff and it might be a little bit disconcerting or maybe create some level of uncertainty or fear. We definitely don't want to do that, but um, bring it back to, you know, each and every person that's listening that, you know, we, we have challenges in life and, and certainly more so now than ever. But to, to find salvation hope in all of this is that this is, if we're, if we're in the middle of a deconstruction of a house and we're about to rebuild the new home, um, if we knew the outcome, which is that we've seen the architect designs, we know what it looks like, we're really excited in the deconstruction, we're just so excited, oh my God, this is so amazing, we've pulled down the old house, we can't wait to start laying the new slab and putting up the new walls and this is so, it's going to be so beautiful, I can't wait to live in my new home. We really want to embrace a degree of excitement and, um, and positivity for not just the planet but for our own individual lives and know that there's this beautiful intelligence supporting this ongoing process that's so maternal and so loving and caring and even though at times it doesn't seem like life is good but this is just the process of being guided it's the process of being supported and moving us in a direction that we might not know what that direction is we might not have an awareness about how we're supposed to be but it is still giving us nourishment and guidance even though it feels kind of bleak and challenging at times and just um really maybe find some solitude and quietness to just sort of ask what is it this that what what is this experiencing offering me so that i can connect deeper to my inner being to my inner lovingness to my inner heart my soul and know from there that i'm have this wonderful invincibility of just letting love be the pre prevailing sort of energy um that moves me in life nice i like that thank you yes we always want to end on a positive note because it can be overwhelming definitely that's not the intent ever but i think we bring those things up for you know people to become more conscious and aware but then also like you said i mean I don't know. All these emotions really are a gift. I do believe being here. Um, it's unique to feel all the feelings and some of the most uncomfortable feelings can actually propel growth, as you said, with your, your kind of your breakthrough. But yes, I think coming back to, to love and, and not fearing and just being, and, um, I don't know, there's, there's so much opportunity. And I, I think this is all 
a blessing in a way, even though it's really hard. I think there's so much growth happening and so much to come. But like you said, it's up to us. We're in the game. So let's continue to be positive and loving. And I think we can win the game. I really do. It's going to take some work, <laughs> but we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Hopefully we don't have to go on extra time. We can pull I it off. Oh, let's see if we can, we can do it before OT comes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. And I want um, people to be able to find you. So where are you online? Uh, mainly on Instagram at Tom Cronin. Uh, so it's just my name at Tom Cronin. And then uh, my website, tomcronin.com. And okay. if they want to watch the film, they can go to entertheportal.com. Okay, cool. We'll put all that in the description notes of the shows too, awesome. so people can find it easily. Cool. cool. Thank you for your time and for your, all your work that you're doing in the world. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me along. It's great to have a chat. Absolutely. Cool. You guys, thanks for listening. I hope this spurred some new thoughts in your mind and maybe you'll go and do some meditation. Hopefully you've been inspired. Um, you can find me online at Real Lauren Live on Instagram and my website, lauren.live. Thanks, you guys. Bye.